I am uh, so grateful for that song, and I've been telling people throughout this series on grieving to hang in there. Um, one of the things that I intentionally did not want to do was to rush it, to skip steps, and, um, and just talk about hope and resurrection and all of those things for a very, to me, an important reason, and that is if you skip steps in grief, I, I, I think you, you come short. It's like, it's, it's like the caterpillar turning into the butterfly. Um, you can't hurry that process or you come out deformed. And in the struggle, you see that, you see that butterfly starting to emerge, and man, you want to help so bad. You just want to pull it out and, and just free it, don't you? You just you see it just struggling, but the struggle is what makes the beauty. The struggle is what makes the beauty, and you can't rush that struggle. And so because this is a slog, and I've been going through like all these difficult things, depression and anger and bargaining and all of these things that we do when we grieve, um, I've wanted, to, I've wanted to, to let it go slow because I think you have to. And certainly, even the pace that we've taken, you can't just check it off. Uh, as I've said before, how many people are box checkers? Like, I like to check it off. So what you do is you write down the stages of grief. Chris told me what they are. And you put it on your refrigerator, and you just try to bang them out. This is, this is, not, this is not a box checking exercise. They're going to follow you as much as you follow them. It's just how it works. And a lot of times, like the lady who wrote the book on death and dying, identified these patterns. Um, She didn't pull them in a list from the Bible, but what you see is you can go through the Scripture, as we have been doing, or you can look at any human situation and realize this is just what happens. There's shock There's denial, there's anger, there's bargaining, there's depression, and we have to go through these. In Psalms, it's called the valley of the shadow of death. There's the shadow hanging over you, but you realize that you are going to come out on the other side. And so I've been trying during this series to sprinkle in little songs of hope, (laughs) Just so, because you need to keep that little bit of hope alive. You have to to live in reality. Otherwise, you you don't grieve well. And if you don't grieve, because what grieving is, is dealing with the pain of loss. Let's make it very simple. If you love, you're going to lose. If you love, you're going to feel pain. And the only other option is to shut yourself off from loving, from loving people, from loving relationships. And so if you're going to love, you're going to lose. And if you're going to lose, you're going to have pain. And if you're going to have pain, you're going to have grief. It's just how life works. And so at the end of the day, what we're talking about is how you process pain. That's really what grief is. Everyone experiences pain. We all process it differently. And isn't it true, even if I'm talking about what we would call emotional pain from suffering a loss, you feel it physically. Who can say, I felt it physically? I I lost my dog, or I lost my father, or I lost my best friend, or my husband, or my wife. And who who could say here, I felt it in my chest? You say, oh, man, you have no idea how much physical that is. So it's an emotional pain that is so strong, it touches us at our deepest levels, and you can feel it physically, and what we're doing is processing it. And if we process it well, not perfectly, the bar is not perfection, and the bar isn't to follow these steps perfectly because it's a messy process, but if we allow pain to be processed well in us, We can come out healthy. And I will even say this, you can come out a better person than you were. You may not have everything intact the way you wanted it, but you can be a better person. I think that's why Jesus said, blessed are you who mourn. I can't think of any other reason that he said it. 
In fact, I remember I would read these things Jesus wrote, and some of them, they made a ton of sense to me, you know. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself. Check. Put it on the fridge. N nobody? I'll start over here this morning. <laughs> Uh, I mean, love your neighbor as yourself. That's an easy, that's a, that's a no-brainer. I get it. Let's do it. Put it on the fridge. Blessed, happy, euphoric are those that mourn. Next. Am I with me? I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do with that verse. I don't know what to do with that idea. Certainly doesn't seem like something you would embrace. But Jesus was known for this kind of teaching. If you want to save your life, you have to lose it. All of these head scratchers. It's as if Jesus, because in his wisdom, and many people believe Jesus was what you would call a wisdom teacher, he could dig, scratch beneath the surface a little bit. Who remembers the original karate kid, Mr. Miyagi? Huh? There was a wisdom teacher. What would he do? He could just take you, he could just take you a layer, layer down. Say, well, wait, there's more going on here. Kid wanted to learn how to fight, and he taught him how to wax his car. That, that's kind of how Jesus was. People didn't get him right away. Blessed, happy are you who mourn. What happiness could there be in this? Lucky, fortunate. These are all words that you could use. It's as if he took the exact opposite. Like, he made this provocative thing to get you to think and to realize, you know what, I guess... Loss is a part of life, and pain is connected, and so blessed are those that learn how to process it. It doesn't erase our loss. As we've been saying and as was sung about here, Jesus had scars even after the resurrection. But here is the thing. It doesn't erase the loss, but here's the key. The loss no longer controls you. There's the definer. Because for a while, the loss will control you. It'll control your mood. It'll control your, your decisions. It'll control uh, how you treat other people. And when you get through, when you get to the stage we're talking about today, which is acceptance. Acceptance is you come to the place, not that you approve of what happened, not that you're happy about it, but you've come to the place that you recognize that it is and it's not going to change and you accept it. The garden, Matthew 26. I love this because I love how Jesus um, portrays the full humanity of his feelings for us. In other words, when the scripture talks about he, he, he was just, he was, we have a high priest who is just like us. In other words, a good priest, a good pastor, a good spiritual leader in anyone's life stays in touch with the people, knows how they feel, walks in their shoes. Jesus walked in their shoes. He says he, he felt every feeling that we feel. This is good. And so I'll take you to the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus is arrested. He went with his disciples to the place of Gethsemane and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He could feel it coming. Boy, don't we pray more at some times in life, don't we? I mean, don't, don't some things just drive us to pray? By the way, people feel guilty about that. I, I never try to make people feel guilty about that. I get that. What could be more normal than that? <laughs> Your whole world's caving in on you. I mean, the first thing you do is you pray. And when everything's great and you're standing on your own two feet, you know, you pray a little less, let's say. And he prays, and he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, get this, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Man, what a, what a phrase. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. Some of you know exactly what Jesus is saying there. I feel like I'm... I feel like I'm dying. 
Maybe you've lost someone that you love, and the feeling is that you're dying to the point of death. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground, and he prayed, My Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. In other words, let the suffering pass from me. Let, please, God, please. This shows us all of the phases coming into play here. The bargaining. God, please. By the way, you will note oftentimes when people are even at the acceptance phase, they, all of a sudden sometimes people will still reach for something. Maybe there's a miracle drug. Maybe there's a miracle surgery. Maybe, and, and loved ones will do this. You know, well, what if we try this? Or what if we flew them to this hospital? And nothing wrong with it. It's very normal. It's what Jesus is doing. He's like, Father, is there another way? Let this suffering pass from me. Nevertheless, he says, not my will, right? But you, as you will, your will be done. Now, here's what's interesting. He went and prayed a second time. Father, if it's possible, let this cup be taken away. In other words, this isn't a one and done situation. You're going to say the same prayers over and over and over again. Slightly different words, the same thing. I just wish I could tell you, you just wake up one day and bam, you hit to acceptance and you start to move on with your life. It's just not quite that clean. And it says a third time, he did the same thing. In other words, it's just a process, and that's why we've been taking it slow. But what I am here to tell you today is you, you can and you will. You get to the place of acceptance. You'll accept that a chapter in your life is over with. You'll accept that you, you had so many great years with that person, and now that chapter is closed. You will accept that maybe you won't get to raise that child and, and marry them off someday. Oh, the pain. You, you'll accept that you, there's other kinds of loss in life as well, that your job and your career isn't going to be what you thought it was going to be. You'll accept that that pet who was your lifeline is not going to be there anymore. Whatever it is, we, in many areas of life, but you'll get to acceptance. And acceptance means you're awake. Mary went through this. Mary, you remember when she was greeted by the angel, the, the Christmas story that we're starting to remember and celebrate. The angel comes to her and says, Mary, <laughs> Greetings, you, you who are highly favored. And, and right away, Mary recognizes something's, there's too much in this. And she's troubled at the greeting. And she's told that she's going to be with child. Mary knows right away. Now, in her head, how, how could this be? How, you ever say that? How did this happen? Why did this happen? Now, you and I look back at the Mary story, and it's Jesus, and it's wonderful, and it's Christmas, and we can celebrate and go, wow, what a great, wasn't she blessed? But that's not how you feel on day one. We have to remember, she didn't fast forward to the clock in her mind. Right now, she's lost her life. She has no explanation to give anyone. She lost her childhood, her innocence, her family her belonging in our community. She's completely ostracized. She would have been labeled immediately as someone who is non-righteous or unclean. In other words, out. Yeah, I won't make you raise your hand, but anyone ever been out of the religious community that you were a part of? It's not a good feeling. This was her feeling. It was a mourning and as Mary had to process it, it's similar to the prayer of Jesus where she gets to the point and she says, I'm the Lord's servant. <laughs> may it be, may it be as you have said. 
You do, do you see the, the ring in the same prayer of Jesus? I'm the Lord's servant. I accept it. I accept it. I accept what you want. I accept your will. Someone said one time about losing her husband. She said, you know, the one thing that I learned is if you love somebody, you're going to lose. They, they, just, they just go together. And if you, if you go through this process and you let the pain come out, one of the great things that you will find is you will find more healing than you ever thought in some old religious traditions. You will find yourself saying the Lord's Prayer, or you will find yourself saying, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And all these things that kind of, when you were a kid, they went in one ear and out the other, anybody? All of a sudden, they're going to they're, they're, they're gonna be there like this anchor for you. Provide unbelievable amounts of strength and healing. I, I think of Jacob who wrestled with God, and I feel like that's what it is. We wrestle with God, don't we? With the why, God, why? And when Jacob comes out of his wrestling match with God, he's touched his, the socket of his hip. Is, and so for the rest of his life, Jacob walked with his limp. I think that's a good picture. This limp signified something of his remembrance and his dependence on God. His life wasn't going to be the same. He wasn't going to run as fast as he used to run. Anybody here getting older? <laughs> that was an easy question, actually, when you think about the math. Anybody here getting older? And, and when we're young, you know, we just, you just kept thinking, well, I'll always be this fast. I'll always be this strong. I'll always be this good looking. I'll always be this agile. I'll always be this smart. I'll always be, have a good memory. Anybody forget where you're going some days? Literally, like I, <laughs> why did I drive here? But, but the reality is what we do is we mourn something. Paul, Paul said something. Paul goes, I die every day. Now, the more you get in tune with this, you, you get to the place of acceptance and hang in there. Next week, I'm going to talk about resurrection, hope, and then the week after, we're going to talk about meaning, purpose. But when you're in the valley of the shadow of death, you get to the very bottom and you just accept it. It just is. I'm not going to change this. Now, Peter, in the garden, he was going to change it. Hmm? This is your aunt coming in saying, oh, I know a specialist. Oh, I know how to fix this. Oh, right? This is Job's friends coming in with all the answers. People come in at the last minute. Peter's got an answer, a sword. He grabs the sword. He takes a swipe at the servant of the high priest. He, he lops off his ear. He won't accept it. Oh, Peter's right in the throes of anger, isn't he? Just pray to God when you're in that phase, you don't have a sword nearby. You know what I mean? And have someone approve your emails before you send them. And just have someone surround you. You don't do any damage to any, too many relationships. But it's a real thing. I'm not accepting this. I'm not accepting this. You're the Messiah. I'm not accepting this. What do we do when we're, we're angry and when we're bargaining? and We're, we're in these phases. We, why? That shouldn't happen to me. I did this, and I did this, and the reality is it happens to everybody. I'm going to recommend to you throughout this series, just you go through the book of Ecclesiastes, you read the Psalms, you read Job. You go through all of these wisdom books because there's a reason that they're there. One of them is because in Psalms, there's a lot of angry expressions, and the first time you read them, you don't really know what to do with them because a lot of the psalms that we sing in church are all happy. Let's just be honest. Can I just be brutally honest for a minute about how we sanitize death and anger? We just sanitize it. We don't talk about it real. And churches are the worst. 
We all sing happy songs. Isn't this lovely? God is so good. He's wonderful. It's like we all live in happy and acceptance. No one ever goes through the other phases. Now, I don't know what to do about that. I don't know if we can put a grunge band up here. I don't know how to fix it. But I do know if you've ever read the Psalms, if you've ever read them, there's a lot of anger in there. Dash their, dash them against the rocks. You ever want to smash someone's head into a rock? I'll close my eyes because I know you aren't going to vote. But you wanted to. But by pretending we don't have these feelings, it's not helping us process them. Please don't act on them. Can I? Please don't act on them. They're phases. But to deny, but to deny that phase won't get you to accept it. I, was, I did a funeral Friday here and I was telling him it's messy if it takes Jesus three times how many times is it going to take you and me keep praying this God let it pass God let this anger pass from me that's messy and it doesn't ever completely leave Charlie is making an absolute mess of our house. Mess. There's just stuff everywhere. That's all I do is walk around and pick up. That's all I do. I don't serve you anymore. I don't serve God. I serve Charlie. I walk around and pick. That's all I do. And the other day she gets in my house. I mean, you can't, if you turn away, it's nice because she's busy doing something, but she's just busy making more work for you. So you, it's a toss-up. But she's in my office, and she's just moving everything around. And, and, you know, I don't know how she gets, I don't know how she finds things. And they, they end up in all these places. And there on my desk is a card I hadn't seen in a long time. And I must have tucked it away. It was, a, it was a birthday card from my dad. My dad wasn't like the softest guy, especially in the earlier days. He, later on, he, he definitely did, but. It's a little birthday card that I obviously couldn't throw away. And he said, I love you. And now you just get that wave, just that wave just comes over you. Man, that's been over 20 years. Blessed are you who mourn, you'll be comforted. And not only will you be comforted, you'll be changed. Let me drill this in during the series. Let me just drill it in. You can only grow, only grow and change in a certain way through grief. You will grow through loss in ways that you can't grow any other way. If you're like me, I like to grow by reading books. I read so many books. I got books and books. Who likes to they're nice. You just read them. You go, oh, now I know that. Put it on the shelf. <laughs> now I know that. And I'm, man, I'm good. And what it could, it actually builds your ego, builds your head. You can read and read and read and read about grief, and it can not even touch you. Something has to go down, has to pierce. We, for, for good reasons, we have protective layers against really growing. We do, because otherwise we'd be kind of, uh, what's the word, almost like schizophrenic. We're like, here, we're here, we're here. We, we, ha we have to grow very slowly. It's just how we're wired. And so you have these little protective layers. And so you can read a book or a pastor can say something or whatever, but it just, you know, might ribble a little bit. But boy, when you lose somebody, you just, you go through a, a death or a divorce or a disease, man, it just pulls your heart apart. And then God says, I, I, think I, I think I see a little crack there. I can visit that little crack. Which is why in Psalms it says, God is close to the brokenhearted. Now, in 2 Corinthians it says, May the God of all comfort comfort you so that 
you can comfort others in their loss. What you will see and what we will be talking about is once you've received, it can change you. And then you can give. But the changes have to be deep. They, they, they can't be surface because surface doesn't work. I've been a lot of places and a lot of churches, and, and I've been told, you believe this and think that, and you know, I signed on to that. But, but it's, it's different. this is a different level of growth. When people are dying, I'll just close with this, and they get to the place of acceptance, something happens in them. They don't want to go to a rock concert. Oh, I mean, one more concert, and they, they don't want to. It's just not how it works. Um, they want fewer and fewer visitors. They probably don't want to talk a lot. hand gesture will do usually. Maybe a little physical touch. I've been there because of what I do sitting at the bedside. I remember one particular man who's aggressive form of cancer. He was dying and came quickly because it was aggressive and I was called to the bedside. The family was there and I started to talk to him. See the, the yellow in his eyes. But you could see the light in his heart. And he said, I'm okay. And in, in an amazingly short amount of time, he got to acceptance. And what was difficult was the family hadn't got there as quickly. So I found myself in that hospital room spending more time talking with the family than with the dying because I was trying to explain to the family, when a person gets to acceptance, they actually see. And you'll read this in the Scripture, or you can, you can just you can read it in, in books in society. There, there's some level of seeing beyond the veil. I don't know if you, do you understand what I mean? Like, there's stuff you and I can't see. Why? Because you're healthy, because you're still working out. You're at the gym. And so you're like, well, how could you be okay? How could you be okay? You're not there. You can't answer that. But something happens. Trust me. And the veil starts to... I guess it becomes a sheer at first. People start to see. How beautiful the other side is. That there's nothing to be afraid of. Strangely, then there's a longing. A healthy person never feels this. But once that veil becomes thin, there's a longing to go there. The Apostle Paul must have been there. Probably with his recorded so many near-death experiences Paul writes about in his own life being left for dead in Lystra, stoned. I think the veil gets thin. And here's a Paul's words. I'm torn between the two. He felt like he had so much work to do for Christ, and he said, but to be with Christ, which is better by far. So here's part of acceptance. I can't fix it. This is real. But it's better by far. And thank God it's not better by a little. And when you get there, and this might be, this, this might take you a while, but when you get there, you won't force these words. They will flow from you. Not my will, but yours be done mine, but yours be done. Can you stand with me? We'll have a closing prayer. Like Mary said, let it be. May it be as you have said. I'm not going to change this. I'm going to accept it. Can I just be honest? 
it's not news. People, oh, I just got this. And I understand. I understand the context of it. I just got this news. So-and-so has this. So-and-so caught this. Here's the, everybody's dying right now. It's not news. Chris Kramer's dying right now. It's, it's just how aggressive is it? Acceptance is what you, they teach you it's dying early. I think that's what Paul did. I think the Apostle Paul died early. And now you can live your life. Now, when you accept that fact, you can live your life to its absolute fullest, and that's what we're going to talk about. Hope, resurrection, and meaning. Because there's always resurrection, there's always hope, and there's always meaning. God's never done. Isn't that good? God's never done. Our God, we thank you for the grace that you give us, for the hope that you provide. But God, for those that are walking through the valley today, let them feel your, your arms embracing them. God, as we sit with you in the garden praying, God, take this suffering from me. Give us the grace to pray, nevertheless, not my will. To stop continually fighting for our own will. But your will be done. In Christ's name, amen.